This is a busy slide, but it's not so busy if you think of it in the terms that this is the only slide. <laughs> it's one slide talk. This is just the outline to keep me going. Um, what I want to do is tell you about the applications of organic chemistry for nanomaterials and nanomedicine. How organic chemistry is moving into those realms and, and, and having a large impact there. I'll start with with work right here, this is, uh, uh, these are blowout preventers. You heard a lot about blow blowout pre preventers on the deep water horizon in the Gulf. Uh, blowout preventers are, are now being made with carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotubes can be blended into the rubber, but, but the organic component there was, was really quite profound because people were taking carbon nanotubes, which are the strongest structures that will ever be made. And, and, and how can we confidently say that ever be made? It's because if you think of, say, a 1010 carbon nanotube, you have to break 20 carbon-carbon bonds. Each one of those carbon bonds, 1.3 bond order, meaning that it's not a single bond, but a bond order of 1.3. And a carbon-carbon bond is one of the strongest bonds in the universe. So you put all of that together. It's probably the strongest structure as a single polymer strand that will ever be made. When those were put into rubber, you had delamination, where these would pull away from, from the, the host material. And people thought, well, it really weakens the material. But the key was to be able to functionalize these, put little arms on the nanotube so that they would blend in. And it turns out it increases the strength by, by a large amount. So if you take something like polyisobutylene, <clears throat> typical polymer, you can stretch that to about 10 times its normal length before it would break, like a rubber band. But its modulus, its stiffness is not high enough. And so what you do is you add to it carbon black. 50% by weight of the weight of your tire in your car is carbon black, charcoal. That increases the stiffness a lot. But instead of being able to stretch this now 10x, 10-fold, you'd only be able to stretch it about 1.25x, and it breaks. That's no longer the case. If you put carbon nanotubes in rubber, you, you can increase the modulus 10x with no change in the strain it breaks. So it really changes the, the, the dynamic of the rubber industry. Go outside to some highway and count the number of rubber tires that go by, and you'll understand the, 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 uh, how much that affects. There's other work that's been done to take carbon nanotubes and to, to put them in uh, uh, materials for heating. We had found that, that if you take carbon nanotubes and you put them in a, a microwave oven, they'll explode. I called a graduate student one day in around 2001. I said, put these in the microwave oven. He came back. He said, they exploded. So this is great. They really absorb microwaves very well. It turns out that, that Los Alamos then did the calorimetry on these. And there's a near one-to-one -one conversion of microwave to thermal. So they heat to over 2,000 degrees in one second. In fact, there's some work that has shown that heat, heat to over 20,000 degrees in one second in a typical microwave, kitchen microwave oven. <clears throat> so we blended those commercial multi-wall nanotubes that are produced in over 500 tons a year in with NOAX, which is a pre-ceramic polymer, because we're very close to NASA JSC. And I asked them, how are you going to repair things in flight in the space shuttle? They said, well, we go up with NOAX. We put it in there. I said, well, how do you cure it? That's a pre-ceramic polymer. You have to cure it to uh, uh, 1,000 degrees. They said, well, we hope it would cure upon reentry. It's a very <laughs> difficult thing to think about. <clears throat> so it turned out that we got some space shuttle tiles. I asked them for it. They said, that's proprietary material. So we poked around, and we found some, actually, in the, in the machine shop at Rice. We've had a long collaboration, and they left some there. <clears throat> and, and what we can do now is we could just, just add less than 1 weight percent carbon nanotubes, use a 30-watt microwave gun. A typical microwave oven is about 1,200 watts. So 30 watts, low power, it heats to 1,000 degrees in 300 seconds. So we can cure then in flight. Applications of nanotechnology. There's chemistry that's been developed to split carbon nanotubes. And if you unzip them, they'll go to nanoribbons of graphene. Now, graphene just won the Nobel Prize in physics for 2010. Graphene is traditionally made, well, well it was first gotten by taking a chunk of graphite and pulling it up sticking scotch tape to it, pulling it off. And you get graphene, a single sheet of graphite graphene, one atom thick, a single sheet that you can pick up. It's really quite amazing. It's one atom thick, and you can pick this thing up. Well, it then turned out that you can grow this on a piece of copper by, by impinging it with, with uh, methane gas. And we found we could just spin coat a polymer on, the, on, on copper, and we could make this into a single sheet of graphene. And then it turned out we could do it with sugar, table sugar. You put table sugar. It would go to graphene. I said, it's got to work with anything. 
So we took a roach leg, put it on top of copper, heated it to 1,000 degrees. Carbon is carbon. It breaks at 1,000 degrees, and it forms graphene. Anything turns to graphene on copper at 1,000 degrees. So you can get very nice single sheets of graphene. But if you want to make ribbons, this is a nice chemistry to do it. And it turned out using a brew that's potassium permanganate and sulfuric acid, which is from the 1800s, you can split them, and they'll form ribbons. What, what happens, though, is the, the surface is oxidized. And these are good for certain applications because you can actually paint them on a surface and they will all orient with the direction of the paint stroke because they're long and thin and you get this shear stress that orients them. We're using these in, in now radome coatings, these coatings that go, the, these, these shields that go over radar. Uh, there are wires that run through that to de-ice them, but the wires conflict with the RF radiation. So if you use a coating that's less than 100 nanometers thick, you can actually do the de-icing without any interference with the RF. So really simple applications that can be done. We also took uh, uh, potassium with the multi-wall carbon nanotubes, and those will insert, and heating up to 250 degrees, no solvent, just potassium metal, the nanotubes heated up. The potassium will intercalate and then rip them open and split them longitudinally. And this turns out to be really nice for very conductive ribbons. And then all across the edge, you get, you get uh, potassium. So you have an aerial anion. This is a site for polymerization. So this is begging to be, be worked on by an organic chemist. So you just add a vinyl monomer, and you do anionic polymerization right across the edges. So polymer grows all off the edges. So you get these very conductive sheets with polymer all off the edges. This is, this is tremendous for applications where you want tough materials because every polymer strand goes back to an origin point of a rigid material, plus now it's conductive. So you can get conductive rubber, conductive plastic materials, which really changes now again an in industry, can change this way. There's other applications that can be done with graphene. Uh, it turns out if you work with graphene, you'd find that graphene is very hard to filter. So you make solutions of graphene oxide, which is an oxidized form of graphene. It's just a single sheet of carbon with oxygen groups on it in the form of alcohols or epoxides and carboxylic acids at the edges. Water soluble, but you go to filter it, it plugs filters all the time. So it's a frustration. But sometimes people want really good filters. And, and being in Houston, where the oil industry is, we said, well, you, you know, maybe we could apply this to drilling fluid. So every hole that is dug in the ground to get oil out, what happens is a drilling fluid is pumped in. So the drill is actually hollow, and a fluid is pumped in, and then carries the cuttings on the outside of that shaft right up to the top. The cuttings are separated, and the fluid goes back down. Well, what happens is the drilling fluid, which contains a lot of barite, to, to make it heavy, ends up infiltrating the pores of the pristine formation. And so that when you want, ultimately want to yield oil or gas from that formation, often they have to go back and clean these pores out to try to open them up so the oil can drip back in. But we just add now these single atom thick sheets of graphene oxide. And then when they're drilling, you have higher pressure here. These will form a, a uh, filtration barrier. And now when you release the pressure, the oil starts to drip out and just pushes these right back out. So again, it's a very simple application of a material. And we've shown there's ubiquitous bac bacteria that, that will reduce the graphene oxide back to graphene, which agglomerates to graphite, which is a natural mi mineral. So the, there are applications, again, other work that's being done is to take carbon nanoparticles, just carbon nanoparticles, and use them to find oil. Because 30 to 70 percent of every oil well that's dug, it, it, I'm sorry, of every oil well that's dug, 30 to 70 percent of the oil is left down hole. It never comes back up. And part of this is because they don't know it's down there. They don't know when to pull up and, and, and start leaving the site. So what's done is to take carbon nanoparticles that are hydrophobic at their core, their carbon. These are 15 nanometer particles of carbon black produced in bulk already in, 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 uh, uh, for, for the plastics and rubber industry. And then hook groups onto it, like polyvinyl alcohol, which then render this nanometer-sized construct water soluble. Then take these and shake them up with a signaling molecule. They're, they're little red rectangles that, I, that are on here. And the idea is this. There's something already used in the industry called tracers. Tracers are you, you pump 
some system, some molecule into the ground here, and it comes up over here. And it's as if you had a spy. You're going to send him or her into a country. You say, well, we'll put you in on the east coast. You come out on the west coast. That's all you know. It's called a tracer. You can't interrogate them and say, what have you seen when you were in there? It would be very nice if you could interrogate them. So now what we've got is we've got these systems that we pump on down. And what happens when these go in the ground, when they see oil, these hydrophobic red rectangles move into the oil. And then when these come back up, you can probe in near real time how much of these red signaling molecules have been lost. These hydrophobic molecules were given up to the oil. And then you can probe immediately and say how much oil it saw. So in other words, it gives information of what's down hole. Using these nanometer sized particles, again, it's an application of organic chemistry to modifying a structure that can apply to a situation where it's well needed. In medicine, uh, using nanoparticles in medicine, it's really, really quite amazing. What, what, uh, the, the work that's being done, for example, is, is with traumatic brain injury. Now, many nanoparticles are, are being constructed that can do drug delivery. But how about inherent properties within the nanoparticle itself to do uh, a therapeutic action? And it turns out there's these systems called pegylated hydrophilic carbon clusters. These are about one nanometer in diameter and about 30 nanometers long of carbon. The surface is oxidized, and then a polyethylene glycol, a water-soluble addend, is attached along it. And they're similar, in fact, to these, but they're a little bit smaller than these are, these polyethylene glycols. And these turn out to be quite non-toxic. Most of them go right out the liver. Uh, I'm sorry, right out the kidneys. The larger agglomerates will go into the liver and then out the bile duct and out the feces. Non-toxic materials. <clears throat> so the work that's being done is in traumatic brain injury. These are, these are images of, of rat brains that have been excised after some event. So a rat is anesthetized, their brain is exposed, and, and th the brain is impacted with a steel ball that's dropped from a certain height. And that induces a traumatic brain injury. And you can see a small contusion that forms on the brain. When the brain injury is accompanied by hemorrhagic shock, so in other words, when a soldier has some head injury from a shock and then also loss of blood, it's exacerbated. The effect is exacerbated. So here is just hemorrhagic shock. Of course, you have no contusion on the brain. But when you have a brain injury, when, when, when an individual has a brain injury accompanied by 60 minutes of hemorrhagic shock, 60 minutes where there's been a loss of blood, there's a large contusion left in the brain that remains there. So when there's hemorrhagic shock accompanied by, by traumatic brain injury, that has a, a tremendous deleterious effect. And the reason for that is, is that once there's a loss of blood, superoxide starts forming, and it swamps out something called superoxide dismutase, which is, which is the natural system to take up the superoxide. But then what happens is, in our, our, our desire to save the patient, First, in the ambulatory phase, they're, they're infused with saline to bring the blood pressure up a little bit. And then there's a spike of superoxide. And then reinfusion of blood in the hospital. Then there's another spike of superoxide. And this is superoxide that degrades the brain like that. And so what we found is to take these carbon nanoparticles, which are very potent radical scavengers and will gobble up the superoxide, you can look at the, this DHE. This level in the vessels is characteristic of the amount of superoxide that's in the blood vessels in the brain. So this is the normal amount. Then there's this spike up of superoxide content. And then if you add these, before you do the reinfusion of the saline or of the blood, you come back down to normal level, levels. So it lowers the superoxide in the brain and the vessels, and it increases the cerebral blood flow. So here's a nanometer-sized construct that's doing a medicinal application other than just delivering a drug, but itself is active. And I'll finish up with this. This is, this is the nanocars that were mentioned. And, and the reason I'm finishing up with this is because these have no practical application today. But that's OK. This is where governments, I feel, should be investing money in things that have a portfolio where some things have near term, some things mid term, and some things long term where, where they would deli deliver in the long term. And these are single molecule cars that are about 2 nanometers by 3 nanometers. 
This is a, a, uh, a carburane wheel. Three water molecules across is about the diameter of that wheel. To put this in perspective, how small is a water molecule? Uh, when you take one swallow of water, that's a mole of water, 6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. If you had, instead of 500 sheets of paper that you stick into your laser printer, if you had 6 times 10 to the 23rd sheets of paper, although paper is paper thin, that stack of paper would reach from the Earth to the Sun 400 million times. So you would have 400 million stacks of paper from the Earth to the Sun if you had a mole of paper, which is the number of water molecules you swallow in one swallow of water, which three water molecules is about the diameter of that wheel. So these are really small cars. We parked 30,000 of these across the diameter of a human hair. You can see that here's a car. It's going to turn and move across the surface. These are just different screenshots. It turns and it moves right across this surface. This is a surface of gold. Just learning how, to, how, how these move. These don't slide like a car on ice. They actually uh, may hit a divot and then pivot a bit and then continue translating. But if you have a trimer, if these were just like a car on ice, you would expect the trimer also to slide, but it doesn't. It only rotates around its axis. Now, this car is different than these cars. This car has a motor in it. This motor is a unidirectional motor. You shine a light on it, it rotates at 3 megahertz. So 3 million rotations per second, this motor rotates unidirectionally. And there's a, there's a, there's a good organic chemist reason why this this rotates in only one direction. It's because there's a stereogenic center here, there's a chiral center there, and there's a chiral axis there. When this goes into an excited state, there are two possible ways it can rotate right or left, but because there's a pre-existing stereogenic center, they're diastereotopic. They're different in energy, and so it keeps going over the lower energy side. But this is to build vehicles that one day will do the translation, will be able to pick things up and deliver them pick things up on a surface and deliver them. We see a building. We still build buildings like we've been building them for 5,000 years. We bring in bricks and sticks and mortar and we build. Everything in nature is built differently. It's built from the bottom up. Molecules coming together that, that have certain interactions, those are thermodynamic interactions. But sophisticated structure also always has to have nanomachines, and nature's nanomachines are enzymes. They take things and they build. We are irregular structures. You, you, you can never get complexity out of regular structure. You have to have irregular structure. This is built by nanomachines. So what we envision is being able to pick things up, move them in place. Initially, we would make a 50-bit, a 50-atom quantum dot memory. Just bring in 50 atoms, you, you have a, a quantum dot memory. And build from there. But can you bring in small entities and have them build from the bottom up. And you say, well, this is science fiction. Today it is. But remember, we chop down a tree, we build a podium. That tree was made from the bottom up. Everything in nature, including you and me, was built from the bottom up by little nanomachines building. That's what we'd like to see someday. That's the applications of organic chemistry. Thank you.